Welcome to chapter two, Portraying the Earth. What you are seeing right now is Earth at night. And you can see a lot of different urban areas throughout this planet. And those urban areas are just continuing to grow. But in this chapter, we're gonna focus on some of the tools that we use in geography to understand the Earth. We're gonna look at maps, and concepts related to maps like map scale, map projection. Then we're gonna get into three primary types of technologies that we use in geography. Remote sensing, global positioning systems, and geographic information systems. Before we do that, my question for you is, can you make something round or spherical like a ball and flatten it without issues or distortions? The answer is no. The reason why I bring this up is this comes into play when we deal with map projections. So imagine you had an orange and you peeled that orange. And then you took the orange peel and tried to flatten it out. As you can tell here, you have tears in that orange peel. Essentially, when we are trying to talk about map projections, Think about this orange peel. So up here in the upper right hand portion we have the earth and a globe is essentially a much smaller version of the earth. If you started to take pieces of that globe and peel it off you would get an image that looks like this at the bottom of the right hand figure. As you can tell it looks strange you don't really see maps that look like that. That's because if a map like this is being made, they add additional land or water to the map to make it look nice. Unfortunately, areas to the north and to the south are extremely distorted. In fact, based on this map, Greenland and Africa look about the same size. But in reality, Africa is about 10 times bigger than Greenland. There are three major map projection classes. We have cylindrical projection, planar projection, and conic projection. All of these greatly distorts one part of the earth, yet preserves a lot of the map properties of another part. So we just talked about a type of cylindrical projection, the Mercator projection. The areas around the equator are relatively um, good, I should say, but near the poles, greatly distorted. If we're looking at a planar projection, then we are talking about areas near the North Pole that are preserved and quite accurate. The farther you are away from the North Pole, the worse the distortion gets. And then we have the conic projection, which is accurate around the mid-latitudes, but is more distorted as you get away from the mid-latitude. Now, there's a whole other class of map projections that are used or actually created by computers and use mathematical equations to try to distribute distortion throughout the planet a little bit more. And you just see one of those examples here called the oval projection. Now, bottom line or the biggest point I want you to take home with this is that no map is free of distortions. No matter how fancy the computer is and the math behind it, we still can't have something flat that represents something that's round that's free of distortion. Map scales are probably some map scales are probably something that you've seen on a map before but never really thought about it. They basically tell us how much smaller the area of that map is compared to the area it represents on the real world. So first thing you got to know, maps are always smaller than the area that they represent. That should be pretty obvious. It doesn't make sense if you make a map of your bedroom. That's the size of your bedroom. <laughs> However, there are cases probably that they're, that's pretty close. So we, what we need to do in all cases 
is make sure we know exactly how much smaller that map is. So map scales are necessary for understanding relationships in terms of area and distance. So as it says here on the slide, map scales are necessary to understand realistic distances on a map. So a scale is that relationship between the distance or area on the map and the distance or area on the Earth. And there are three primary types. This map on the right-hand side shows Florida and the Bahamas. And up here in the, in the upper part of the map, we have three types of map scales. The graphic scale that uses a graphic bar to show you exactly the kind of distance on the map and its actual numerical values in the real world. For example, if I went from 0 to this 50 right here, this distance here on, on the map, which is probably, at least to me, maybe an inch long, is really 50 miles in the real world. The fractional scale we'll get to in a second. The other kind that you may have seen before is verbal scale, where they literally tell you what a centimeter is in the real world, usually in kilometers, or what an inch is in the real world, which is usually in miles. For example, if you measure an inch on the map, that would represent 125 miles. Now the problem with graphic and verbal scales is that you are confined to the unit of measurement that they use on these maps. So what a fractional scale does is it tells you in any unit you want what that is, what that relationship, what that relationship is from the map to the real world. For example, this map scale has a representative fractional scale of 1 to 7,920,000. That means that one inch on this map equals 7,920,000 inches in the real world. It also means one centimeter on this map equals 7,920,000 centimeters in the real world. And so you can insert any kind of unit you want, and it's very uh, user-friendly for people that, that use maps quite a bit, such as geographers. Now, one concept that can get students mixed up is what we considered large versus small map scales. And what we're referring to is really this fractional scale. So over here, instead of writing 1 colon 100 million, I'm using an actual fraction to help you understand this. So when we're dealing with small scales, we are actually dealing with a larger denominator. So over here is 1 divided by 100 million. Fast forward and we're zooming in, zooming in more into a large scale map. Notice that the denominator is smaller. That's 1 divided by 250,000. So what that means is the larger the, de the larger the denominator, the smaller the scale. And you can use your calculators at home to actually do this. Take 1 divided by 100 million, record that number, and then take 1 divided by 250,000, record that number, and see which one is larger. If you did it correctly, this one would be larger. Another way to remember this is that a large scale has a lot of detail, or a small scale has very small detail. That's another sort of way to remember that. So now we're getting into some of the technology of geography. Remote sensing is very important for areas where we don't have people or urbanization to see things. What do you think is the primary technology behind remote sensing, just based on looking at these images? If you guess satellites, you are correct. Satellites have been revolutionary for weather phenomena and for other types of Earth phenomena that, again, that we're not able to see from the surface of the Earth. So over here on the left-hand side, we're looking at ice in and around Antarctica. 
or trying to get a full picture of ice. This would not be possible without a satellite. On the right hand side, we're looking at clouds, which helps us, helps us understand weather systems. Again, something that we can't see necessarily from the ground, and we definitely don't have a lot of instruments to see these types of weather systems in the ocean. As, we, as we'll learn later, one of the most pivotal technologies for understanding hurricanes is satellites, and all of these satellites are using remote sensing. Have you ever used Google Earth before? How about Google Maps? How about a GPS in your car or on your phone? These, the GPS devices actually use satellites as well. But, but what I'm getting at is, if you've used any of these technologies in the past, then you have used what's called geographic information systems. Now, I am stressing this for many reasons. One reason is that GIS has revolutionized the field of geography. And it has made making maps and analyzing geographic data so much more robust and essentially easier. Also, we have a GIS program here at Pierce College where you can get either an associate's degree or a certificate and go out into the, in the field, in the workforce, or add a specialty to your own major and use GIS to analyze spatial data. So what is GIS? GIS really is just any kind of computer system that can analyze and display spatial data. GIS uses maps that are already in a computer. And we can overlay several kinds of maps onto each other in a very easy manner, as long as there are location coordinates that can be linked. So for example, here we're looking at population increase from 1951 to 2005 in the Cape, the, I believe this is Cape Cod, yes, Cape Cod and Massachusetts. And very easily is along, you know, one of the biggest, probably one of the, the hardest parts of GIS is gathering the data. But once you have the data and you can create maps, then you can easily display different parts of that map and analyze data itself. Another thing about GIS is that there are lots of layers associated with this. So what I have here are, is a representation of different layers that make up one map. We have an image from a remote sensing device. We have a map of zoning, floodplains, wetlands, land cover, soil, survey control, and then we can create our final map. In addition, this map is not static. In other words, once this map is created, it's not just it's not, it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be in its final form. We can easily manipulate this map in a computer, and that makes it really robust. This is so much better than some of the paper maps that you may have seen in the past or have in your textbook, that basically once they're printed, they're done. With GIS, they're alive. In addition, behind every map are Excel-like tables so we can very easily change and update data, and that can automatically update the map, which then is another layer or another way that GIS is more robust and makes maps and geography more alive. 